Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Nicholas Christakis, who is Professor of Social and Natural Science, Internal Medicine and Biomedical Engineering at Yale University. He directs the Human Nature Lab at Yale. His current research is focused on the social, mathematical and biological rules governing how social networks form and the social and biological implications of how they operate to influence thoughts, feelings and behaviors. Welcome, Nicholas. Thank you so much for having me, Gil. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So you do a lot of interesting, uh, very interesting work um, at your lab uh, at Yale. And one area is uh, you call it experiments with face-to-face network. Uh, You say a significant amount of our attention is devoted to the development of new ways to intervene in social networks to promote public health. Um, this is sort of a topical area uh, for us uh, right now. And uh, I saw there was an, a, an experiment that was completed or going on in Honduras. Yeah, so we have two categories of broad categories of experiments. And before I talk about those, I'd like to back up and just give a metaphor for listeners. So as most, <laughs> yeah. so as most listeners probably learned in high school chemistry, Carbon has different allotropes or different forms of carbon. For example, you can have graphite, you know, pencil lead, which is soft and dark, or you can have diamond, which is hard and clear. And there are two key intellectual ideas there. First of all, this, this softness and darkness and hardness and clearness are not properties of the carbon atoms. They're properties of the collection of carbon atoms. Right. And second, which properties you get depends on how you connect the carbon atoms to each other. You connect them one way and you get one set of properties, take the same carbon atoms and connect them another way and you get a completely different set of properties. And it's the same with human groups. You can take a group of people and you can structure the topology of their social network ties, the architecture of the ties. You structure those ties one way and that group of people might be happy, healthy, cooperative, and innovative. Where you take the same human beings and, the, and you reconnect them in a different way, and they are unhappy, unhealthy, uncooperative, and uninnovative. So we can think of these properties as emergent properties of the system that depend yeah. on how the parts are connected. So this is how the whole comes to be greater than the sum of its parts. So in my laboratory, what one of the things that we do is, is we do experiments with this idea in, in two broad categories. One one category is a category of experiments we do online, and we've written some software called Breadboard, and there's a little video about it at breadboard.yale.edu, and this software allows us to create temporary artificial societies of real people. Uh, Mm -hmm. Tens of thousands of humans have been participants in our experiments. This software is integrated with Amazon Mechanical Turk, and we can recruit thousands of people from that medium or other media, 
and and drop them into these temporary artificial societies that we create and we drop them into a society in which we organize the connections one way or for instance into a society in which we organize the connections a different way and then we can see what happens and experimentally create artificial societies and and do experiments with with thousands of people and hundreds of groups or for instance and in in, we had a paper we, we've had quite a few papers on this we had a paper in 2017 in the journal nature using this technology we also had another paper in pr the previous year in the journal nature looking at um inequality where we we randomly assigned people to societies with different amounts of economic inequality so we gave people real money to play with but we experimentally manipulated how unequally that money was distributed and the structure of the networks into which they were dropped. And we explored how that inequality affected the ability of the group to work together, for example. So that's one category of experiment. So, Nick, yeah. so when, you say, when you say you drop people, I'm talking about the bread box yes. um, product. When you say you drop people into it, um, these are real people they're getting some uh, some sort of a questions or something uh, from, from the system and they're responding to, how, how do you get the, the yes. feedback? Maker? So the people are dropped into a network and for example, they're given a little bit of money to play with and they're introduced to their neighbors. They, they, you know, I would say you, you have people, A, B, C, and D are your neighbors. And I have, uh, have C, D, E, and F as my neighbors. And someone else has, has you and me and F and G as his neighbors and so on. So we only can see the people with whom we're directly interacting, but we're part of a larger network. And the scientists, that is to say me and my team, can engineer these interactions in very particular ways. For example, I might put you in a situation in which you have four connections, but unbeknownst to you, all four of your connections are connected to each other. And, and, and I might put someone else into a group in which they also have four connections, but none of their connections are connected to each other. And so now the question is, how does your experience versus that other person's experience vary according to whether the people to whom you are connected are in turn connected to each other? This is known as the transitivity of a network. So we can experimentally manipulate how much transitivity right. there is in a network and then test how it affects the ability of groups, for example, to, to perform collective actions. We might give the group a challenge to, to solve a problem, for instance. So, so that's what we mean. So we, 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 we drop them into a network, we introduce them to specific other individuals, and then they interact in this website, uh, you know, in simplified but realistic ways. Yeah. And so, um, so, so do you have some uh, sort of hypotheses emerging from it in terms of uh, what, so, so can, do you have some predictability? Um, yes. If you were to engineer a specific type of network, what you expect yes. to see from it. Yeah, so we have all kinds, we test, that's one of the beauties of the system is we can empirically test our predictions. We have theory might suggest, yeah. for instance, that, for instance, there's a, there were theoretical predictions about how much rewiring in the network was optimal for people to be cooperative. So for example, if you, if you drop people into a very rigid network where they are stuck, you have, let's say 20 people, each of whom is connected to three or four other people in this group, and they start playing a cooperation game with each other where they are, you know, they're trying to, to be generous to their neighbors and hope that on the next round, their neighbors will be generous with them. But of course, if their neighbors exploit them and take advantage of them, then they stop being generous. And you might find that, uh, that after a few rounds of the game, no one is generous with anyone else anymore because they don't want to be exploited. And so everyone, the whole system collapses into acrimony and, and, and what's mm -hmm. known as defection. And, uh, mm -hmm. And, and it turns out that we can experimentally manipulate how much, how much, how, what capability the participants have to rewire their networks, to change their partners. And if you allow them just the right amount of partner change, then in fact, the system does not collapse. This was a paper we published. Well, we published several papers on this. But anyway, so, so, so these are the kinds of, and that was predicted by theory. And we were able to do experiments that tested this idea. And, but, but, but this is all one category. We have a whole other category of projects yeah. where we, as you said, in Honduras, where we work in the developing world, we've also worked in India, in Mumbai, in Uganda. We've worked in many countries around the world where we use another software we have called Trellis, T-R-E-L-L-I-S. And again, there's a video about that at trellis.yale.edu. And we map the face-to-face -face interactions in these villages 
And then there we use mathematical algorithms to try to identify who are the structurally influential people in these villages. In other words, if you were going into a village and you you wanted to, to persuade 10 out of 100 women to vaccinate their children such that if they did that, all other 90 of the women would copy them, who are the 10 women that you should you should educate about this so that you have this big bang for your buck. So right. <clears throat> so that you can introduce, you can create these artificial tipping points. And so we've done experiments to show that that's possible for a whole host of public health practices in multiple countries. For example, in India and in Mumbai, we were able to show in partnership with a Tata conglomerate that uh, we could foster the adoption of iron fortified salt to decrease <clears throat> anemia in babies by shrewdly targeting who we made the offers of the iron fortified salt to. So, yeah, this uh, this structurally influential people, as you say, uh, Nicholas, I think, uh, so I, I've done some work in organizations, large mm -hmm. organizations, and find something very similar inside companies. Yes. Um, where, you know, you have this informal networks, the, the really influential people in a company don't necessarily have big titles, uh, but they are, they're really influential in the sense that people go to them for advice. And those people, uh, if they're not, uh, if they're not, uh, you know, uh, sort of agreeing to a, a strategic direction for a company, the company can't really do anything. Yes. <laughs> Even though all the CEOs, Thanks. Are uh, trying to pull the company in one direction. It doesn't go. Yes. There. Well, I think so, that's yeah. the difference right. between, I guess you would call it hierarchical power and structural power. You know, there are people, yeah. you know, you can imagine in a village, for instance, there might be someone who is very wealthy. I mean, they have a certain kind of power, but you can also imagine a kind of network structure like this, these dots and lines that connect people. And you should have the intuition that there could be specific locations within the network, which would confer a kind of structural power. And, and, and another way to cultivate that intuition is to, is to say, if you, were, if you were a bioterrorist and you were trying to get the most people infected in a city, you wouldn't necessarily infect the richest person first. You should have the intuition that you would infect the most popular person first. And, and that right. sort of highlights the difference. Right, right. And so, so what's the mechanism by which you identify them? This, in, in Honduras, again, this is a large study, 30,000 yes. people or something? Yeah. Well, um, we, we have a number of, there, there, are very, there are various mathematical tricks for identifying structurally influential people. In the Honduras study, we were testing one particular algorithm, which we've also done before in a different part of Honduras, which is something known as the friendship paradox. And the friendship paradox is a, is a mathematical property of human social networks, which states that your friends have more friends than you do. And, and, and the reason for that is that if you count up in a population of 100 people that are interconnected in a certain way, and each of them has a different number of friends, if you look at the average number of friends, that might be mu, you know, the Greek letter mu would be the average of the number of yeah. friends, but the average number of friends that each that each person's friends have is mu plus the variance in the degree distribution divided by mu. And I, I can cultivate an intuition by this by saying, imagine you have a, a party host that has a hundred friends and all of that person's friends are, uh, are um, wallflowers. You know, they have no friends except the party host. And so I have a party where I invite my hundred friends. And now a scientist comes and asks, picks people at random in my household and says, Who's your friend? 100 people would identify me as the party host, as their friend. And for those 100 people, right. every one of them, their friend, would have more friends than they do. I have 100 friends. Right. They each have one friend. Only if and only if you pick me would I have a friend who has fewer friends than I do. So, right. so, the, so this is a property, a fundamental property of human social networks. That was an extreme example. But the reason this is so wonderful is that you can go into a village in the developing world or into a firm or into a school, and you pick people at random, and you say, who are your friends? And they tell you. And then you pick one of their friends. That person yeah. will, in fact, be closer to the center of the network and will, in turn, have more friends themselves than the original people you picked. This is the trick that we've been evaluating in Honduras, and it works. Yeah. 
Yeah, that, so so this has a lot of practical applications, as you say, uh, as you mentioned in the Indian example, and we are in the midst of a pandemic now uh, with vaccines um, coming to, to save us, so to speak. Uh, do you see something like this uh, being applicable in the U.S. setting? Yes, I mean this 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 type of technique can be used for uh, to foster social contagions. Can be used for all kinds of things, like you know, as you're saying, mask adoption, vaccine adoption, any kind of attitude or behavior you're trying to incentivize. You can more rationally pick targets for intervention. And I should say that this friendship nomination technique is just one technique. There are other more sophisticated but more demanding. Um, techniques that you can also use, for example, something called K cornice. Uh, but, but, but this is a very easy to use one, we believe, and has certain other advantages, certain other practical and mathematical advantages. Yeah. So, uh, more more recently, Nicholas, you have written a few pieces in Wall Street Journal and and elsewhere regarding COVID. And, and one of them is, uh, you say, how the Swiss cheese model can help us beat COVID-19. Yes. And you say no single solution will stop the virus spread, but combining different layers of public measures and personal actions can make a big difference. So so how do you, how do you reach this conclusion? Well, this is the Swiss cheese model is a classic model of complex system failure that was offered by psychologist James Reason about 30 years ago trying to understand the failure of nuclear power plants or airline crashes or medical injuries in hospitals, you know, doctors that or patients that are injured when they're admitted to hospitals. These typically have, these complex systems typically have physical, human, and biological components all combined. And um, right. and, and, and Reason said you need to think about these systems as, as having layers of defense and each layer is like a piece of Swiss cheese. So and but each layer is imperfect, has certain holes in it. Let's 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 talk about this with respect to COVID. Imagine that one layer is wearing masks, and one layer is hand washing, and one layer is physical distancing, and one layer is testing, and one layer is border closure, and one layer is school closure, and so on and so forth. We have a whole set of layers. Now, each of them can work to stop the virus some or even a lot, but it's like a layer, it's like a piece of Swiss cheese. It has some holes in it that the virus can penetrate. But the defects in one layer tend to be completely independent of the defects in another layer. So if you stack up a few layers of Swiss cheese, like three or four layers, by then all the holes will be covered up by other layers of cheese. So if you if you make a sandwich with like three or four pieces of Swiss cheese, even though each of them has holes, by the time you've added the third or fourth piece of cheese, there's no longer a way you can look through the stack. And so this creates a barrier, a penetration barrier for failure or, for example, for the movement of the virus. And, and what this means is once you begin thinking about this way, this is also in, in, in the defense industry, this is also known as defense in depth. Uh, once you begin thinking about this, you can begin to understand a whole lot of phenomena. For example, it may not matter what any particular country does to stop the virus so long as they do enough things. Like if... Each country can pick, let's say, three different things. You know, New Zealand can yeah. do border closures and uh, contact tracing. Korea can do mask wearing and testing. Uh, Greece can do school closures and uh, masking and gathering bans. It doesn't matter so long as you have enough layers, then you can stop the epidemic. So that's one insight. Another insight is that, for example, why, why did the White House become a super spreading event? Well, because they only had one layer of Swiss cheese. They only had testing. They didn't engage in masking or, or physical distancing or anything else. So it was bound to fail eventually, and it did. So this, this – um, and, and finally, it also gives you a little bit of understanding about vaccines because vaccines are very good, but they're not perfect. Remember the trials suggested that the vaccines were 95% effective. That means there's still some holes in that layer, which means that we may need to continue to use other layers – of protection for a number of years as we continue to face the epidemic. Yeah, yeah, that's an important insight. So, you know, uh, many many are under the impression that once the vaccines get up to 50, 60 percent of the population, we are done with it. Uh, but it's highly unlikely uh, for many reasons, right? Um, we have to get probably six billion people vaccinated because 
one country cannot maintain herd uh, uh -huh. herd immunity by right and so so this idea that um you know we have to get vaccination but we have to continue with the other uncorrelated so to speak yes. actions well also with vaccination i mean yeah. herd immunity is a very important landmark but um but i mean let's we have to understand that it's it's only uh it's it's uh it doesn't mean that the virus is eradicated. I mean, the virus still circulates and can still kill people. It's just that it's we've taken the wind out of its sails. Its epidemic potential has been stopped. I mean, right. keep in mind we vaccinate against uh, against uh, measles, for instance, or or mumps, and and but measles and mumps still exist. They've not been eradicated, and they can still occasionally cause outbreaks when the vaccination levels fall below the herd immunity threshold. So. So yes, I think getting to the herd immunity threshold is extremely important, and it, it's going to be at you know I would say before this new mutant strain of the virus became more common, I was saying we needed at least fifty percent of people to be vaccinated. Now I think the number is going to have to be a bit higher because the pathogen's a bit more contagious. But um, but yes, I mean, uh, but but even and we will get there, which will be great either by vaccinating enough people or by natural immunity you know, with more and more people. Yeah, you have. You have another another piece in Wall Street Journal, um, Nicholas. The the yes. long shadow of the twenty twenty four and beyond. So you say even when the world uh, world returns to normal, the legacy of COVID nineteen will transform everything from wages and healthcare to political attitudes and global supply chain. So you you see this sort of a permanent change um, in the system, not just shock. Well, yeah. I mean, what's going to happen, I think, if you look at the history of respiratory pandemics, is that right now it's miraculous. We, we've we invented a vaccine. Um, we are the first generation of humans that are facing this ancient threat of plagues uh, who is able to, in real time, invent a specific countermeasure in the form of a vaccine. I mean, it's astonishing. However, we still have to manufacture, as you said, hundreds of millions of doses. We have to distribute those doses, often in complicated ways. And most importantly, we've got to persuade people to accept those doses, and at least half of the population needs to be vaccinated. So all of that's going to take time, I would say at least a year. At the rate the United States is vaccinating, it'll take five years. Uh, and But meanwhile, the virus is spreading. So the way I see it, we are going to be living in this sort of changed world where we have to wear masks and physical distance and all of that stuff for at least another year, have intermittent school and business closures until around 2022 when we have the, um, when we reach herd immunity. And then the epidemiological impact of the virus will be behind us, but we'll see, we still will have to cope with the social, psychological, and economic impacts. You know, our economies have been devastated. Uh, millions of people are out of work. Millions of businesses have closed. Millions of children have missed school. Millions of people will be disabled, if not killed by the virus. So all of that will take a couple of years, I think, to recover from, judging from the history of epidemics. And then in 2024, approximately, we will enter what I think is the post-pandemic period. And uh, finally, we will have put the epidemic behind us. And I think that, uh, you know, that'll be a very, that'll be a party in some ways. People will be so relieved, you know, to have it all behind us. Yes. Yeah, but beyond 2024, though, um, there could be, I mean, we don't really know the long-term effects um, of, of the disease, right? So, you know, especially those uh, who had severe reactions to it. Um, I was told that uh, the, the flu, um, Spanish flu um, 1918 episode, uh, millions of people got Parkinson's 10 years later after surviving the flu. Um, and so we, we actually currently have no data about the long-term effects of this either. And so th that, you know, from a disease burden perspective, that's not something that we have really. Yeah, seen. I mean, I think, uh, and we can't know in advance. First of all, I, I, the, the 1918, I was not familiar with the Parkinson's 10 years later, but I am familiar with a whole host of other biological and social sequelae of infection with a virus from 1918 yeah. that afflicted people a generation of people for decades afterwards. So you're right about the general point. I didn't know about the Parkinson's. But on coronavirus, we can't be certain, of course, until the passage of time. But uh, current estimates are that perhaps five times as many people will have long-term disability of some kind as die from the condition. So if 1% of people die, then 5% of people will 
and I'm not talking here about long COVID. I'm not talking about people who have a long course of the illness at the beginning. I'm talking about you recover from the disease, whether you're sick for a week or six weeks, you recover, but you have some damage to your kidneys or lungs or heart or brain and, and, and therefore some disability. And, and they're, they're likely to be quite a substantial number of such people, unfortunately. Right, right. And, and the stress that it could place on the healthcare system and, and all of that. Absolutely, still yes. Out. So, yeah. We'll, we'll take a quick break, Nicholas. When we come back, we'll talk about uh, one of your fascinating books, The Origins all right, of thank the you. Society. Thank you. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com. We're back, uh, Nicholas, we were talking about some of the interesting work that you do in human networks, both face-to-face -face and uh, electronic uh, at your uh, lab at uh, Yale, Human Nature Lab. Um, I want to talk a bit about one of your books, um, The Origins of a Good Society, um, that, that came out, I guess, a few years ago? Just a year ago. <laughs> I wasn't <laughs> expecting to write Apollo's Arrow about the pandemic so soon afterwards in 2020. <laughs> the book you're referring to is Blueprint, The Evolutionary Origins of a Good Society. And that, yeah. that came out in 2019, yeah. Ah, 2019. Okay, yeah. And so, so the premise of the book, I, I understand, uh, Nicholas, is that you, you, you see a lot of good aspects of humans. And you argue that, you know, we generally uh, overplay <laughs> the bad parts of humanity and homo sapiens. Um, so, 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 uh, what, so how do you reach this? You know, um, if you look around the world, uh, we see a lot of bad stuff. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but you say a lot of the good stuff we don't see, but but without the good stuff, the system could not have reached where we are today. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm obviously familiar with the fact that um, humans are capable of tremendous awfulness. I mean, you just look at any century or any any millennium is replete with horrors, with, with the pogroms and, and inquisition and uh, cruelty and torture and violence and warfare and hatred and you know all of these awful things but but equally our species is capable of love and friendship and cooperation and teaching and all of these wonderful qualities which i think have not gotten the attention that they deserve and in fact i would argue that that the benefits of a connected life must necessarily have outweighed the costs i would yeah. argue that if every time i came near you you were mean to me or killed me or were violent to me uh, I would be better off living as an isolated individual. We we would not live socially if if it was more costly, more disadvantageous for me to live socially than for me to live independently. Therefore, these good qualities that bind us together must, the value of those qualities must exceed the costs of the bad qualities that divide us. And so, so the book provides an account of how natural selection has shaped not just the structure and function of our bodies and not just the structure and function of our, of our minds, but also the structure and function of our societies and how it has equipped us with what I call a, a, a social suite, a suite of features, of universal features that relate to how we interact with each other. And these include things like the fact that we love our partners. Why? I mean, why do we love our partners? We, 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 don't, we could just mate with our partners, but we don't. We form a sentimental attachment to our partners. This is not, not common in the animal kingdom. Or, for instance, we form long-term non-reproductive unions to other members of our species. Namely, we have friends. Why do we do that? Why other animals don't have friends? We do it. Certain primates do it. Elephants do it. And certain cetacean species do it. Yeah. We also cooperate. We make sacrifices for people who are not genetically related to us. We're one of the few animal species that adopts children who are not related to us. Um, these are all amazing qualities that we have compared to other animals. We 
things. This is people take this for granted. The average, your listeners are taking this for granted that we teach each other things. Why do we do that? Other animals don't teach each other things. Most animals learn independently, learn on their own. A little a little fish in the sea can learn that if it swims up to the light, it finds food there. But we don't just learn independently like that. We also learn socially by observing others. For example, if you put your hand in the fire, you learn that it burns. That's independent learning. Or I can watch you put your hand in the fire. And I also learn that it burns, but I, but it's very efficient because my hand doesn't get burned as a result. In other words, I gain almost as much knowledge, fire burns, but I pay none of the price. So social learning like that is incredibly efficient. Now, we do that, and certain other animals also do that, although that's much less common, social learning, than independent yeah. learning. Yeah. But finally, we teach each other things. I teach you to light a fire, and this is exceedingly rare, and it's a product. It's what allows us, one of the crucial things that allows us to be so successful as a species. Anyway, the point is we've evolved all these wonderful capacities, and that's what I mean when I talk about the evolutionary origins of a good society. Yeah, so so I wonder, Nick. I, I don't know if it's in the book. Um, you know, these these good qualities and good attributes uh, that appears to be somewhat special to us compared to compared to other animals. I wondered if it is infinitely scalable, though. In other words, uh, do we do this in in very uh, limited uh, circles? Yes. So, you know, uh, is that what we find in the data? Yes, that's a very good question. So you're right. The, the group size we evolved to manifest these qualities in was um, probably no bigger than like the tribal level. So, you know, we have the family unit of, let's say, five, the extended family unit of about 30 or the camp, you know, which would be a typical size of a group of humans. Uh, we have so-called Dunbar's number of about 150 people and then agglomerates of about a thousand. So you're right. We more commonly have manifested these qualities in smaller scale groups. But we didn't escape that heritage when we evolved and came to make large scale civilizations. Hmm. I'm not saying that in a group of a million people, it's as easy for each person to cooperate with everyone else as it is in a group of 10 people. That's not what I'm saying, yeah. but our cooperative impulses still exist, even though we live in these larger agglomerations. And for example, we still love our partners, even though, and we still have friendships. I mean, one of my favorite examples of this is, if you talk to my grandmother, my Greek grandmother, who's no longer alive, but was born at, you know, in the 19th century, she lived to be in her 70s. And, uh, and you had asked her when she was a little girl, let's say when she was 10 or 11, how many friends did she have? This would have been 100 years ago now. Mm -hmm. She would have said, oh, I had one or two best friends and there were four or five of us girls that lived together. Right. And if you had asked my daughter this question when she was 10 or 11 and, you know, she had an iPhone in her pocket this was you know, now 10 or 15 years ago, she would have given you the same answer. She had one or two best friends and there were four or five girls they hung out together. And th so the point is, is that there's something deep and fundamental about our capacity for friendship, regardless of the technology, the society, the civilization size, and so on. And these are the qualities that I emphasize in, um, in Blueprint. Right. And, and the environment is changing too, right? Um... You know, we were we were um, nomads, and then we uh, invented agriculture, and then we moved to cities. Uh, now the modern life is is quite different from what we used to. So yeah, so but what, I would what, say yeah. yes, that's, you're right. I mean, but these are historical changes over the last since the agricultural revolution over the last ten thousand years. You know, you're exactly right. We've invented agriculture. We've invented cities. We've invented telecommunications. But still, there are some things that are deep and fundamental about us. And when you map human social interactions in the form yeah. of these networks that we've been talking about, for example, you find that there's certain mathematical principles, certain regularities, certain order in these social networks that are the same, whether you map the social networks of, of uh, city dwellers in the United States, or, for example, as we have done, you map the social networks of the Hadza hunter-gatherers who live as in Tanzania now and who live as, as we did, uh, as all humans did up until the Pleistocene. So, yeah. um, you know, so those social networks of the Hadza are the same as ours. Uh, and we found, and, um, and so, you know, there's something very deep and fundamental about these things that we're talking about. Yeah. I, I also wondered, Nicholas, you know, um, these the systems that we build, 
Uh, I wondered if it's 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 somewhat fragile too, without um, you know naming any names. Uh, a large, modern, well-developed democracy came um, close to teetering on the edge by you know uh, by, by by the actions of a madman quite recently. <laughs> Um, and well, it's not so. It's very bad, but it's not so bad. I agree with you, and it's it's astonishing to me. I'm 58 that I'm you know seeing these kinds of things in the United States. You know, our 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 institutions, I think, in the end, are going, and our procedures are going, and our and our processes for distributing power are going to protect us from the totalitarian impulses of this particular person and his followers. But um. So it's not quite so bad, but it is, yes, it is it's troubling what's happening in the United States right now. Yeah, so, so mathematically, I wondered, uh, as we create this more complex systems, in some sense, it's unnatural to us. You know, we, we, we see this in companies, um, you know, you know, not, not to start to grow. Uh, uh, they, they, well, when they hit that Dunbar number, as you mentioned, at 150, a lot of great, great in, in, in companies. And, and so, so, we, so we have that legacy with us, with us but, but we are very, very complex systems, and with that comes risk, I think. Uh, and are we, you know, sort of expanding that risk uh, and concentration of power, more complexity? Are we making the systems more fragile, I wonder? I don't know if there's any mathematical modeling thing. Well, I mean, we- I think... Yes. I mean, I think, you know, there's a sort of theories of entropy. There are more ways for a system to be disordered than there are ways for it to be ordered. And so that's why one of the intuitions behind why disorder is so much easier to achieve than order. Um, yes. So I, I think, yes, more complex systems may may be more susceptible to failure. But what I guess I, I would argue is that there is uh, some fundamental enduring properties of social systems that, um, you know, that that transcend that that transcend politics, that transcend history, that transcend technology. And, you know, I would put some of the things that I've been discussing, uh, love and friendship and cooperation and teaching. And also we, there are other qualities we haven't discussed. Like, for example, we live in, we tend to do best in mild hierarchy. You know, we don't like despotic hierarchies over hierarchical social systems, nor do we do well in totally egalitarian systems. So we like mild hierarchy and we evolved, I think, for various reasons to, um, to, to be that way. So, right. so there are all these properties you see that I think are transcend, as I said, history, technology, politics, and so on. So you're right that there are certain complex systems that can break down, but the breakdown of those systems does not subvert, for example, the love of the love of your partner. For example, in totalitarian regimes, for example, in um in Eastern Germany, they tried yeah. to the family is a very threatening unit. Uh, or as I discuss in Blueprint, if you look, for example, at Israeli kibbutzes, they tried very hard to, to re- because of the burdens of childbearing on, on child rearing on women, they tried to have collective child rearing. Collective child rearing has failed, I think, without exception everywhere it's been tried, because people love their children. They want to be with their own children. You can't design yeah. a political institution. Or in, in Eastern Germany, they tried to have everyone report on everyone else. They tried to have people rat out their friends. And maybe it worked for a generation, but ultimately it collapses because people want to have their own friends. They want to be intimate and trusting of their friends. So it's very difficult to build a system that that for a very long period, uh, you know, uh, subverts these fundamental qualities. Right, right. Yeah. So before I let you go, Nicholas, I just want to touch very quickly on um, one other piece of work that you do, and that is artificial intelligence robots yes. how they how they could be introduced into human systems and, and how that might change us, right uh, could you talk a bit about that well this is part of the work we're doing with our breadboard software platform and also we're doing some face to face robotics here the, the 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 what we're trying to do in my group is we're we're working with what we call hybrid systems of humans and machines so a a social system that has both humans and some machines or forms of artificial intelligence in it. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out, can we endow the the AI units with some forms of simple AI that affect how the humans treat each other? For example, can we get a group of people to work better together and treat each other better 
and cooperate with each other more by thoughtfully introducing a little bit of artificial intelligence into their midst. And we've shown in a series of experiments that that's possible, in fact, that we can uh, yeah. that we can do that. Yeah, yeah. That is uh, uh, perhaps an education, I would imagine. You broke up there for a minute, so I didn't hear you. And, and I was saying that a lot of applications, yes. even perhaps education. Yes, I mean, there are lots of ways. You can imagine, for example, online uh, distributed bots that would uh, reduce racism online or uh, foster positive interactions among people. One of the simplest examples of this I can give you, and just to highlight what we're interested in is, if you think about the people that program digital assistants like Alexa, their focus is on programming that device so that it's very obedient to the human that's using it, so that the human machine interaction is optimized for the human's point of view. So for example, when you ask Alexa to do something, you don't have to be polite. You don't say, I'm very sorry to interrupt you, Alexa. Uh, please, can you tell me tomorrow what the weather will be? Oh, thank you so much. None of that's required. You can just very imperiously tell, you can say, Alexa, weather, and the device will <laughs> obediently do what you've asked, and that is how it's designed, because you wouldn't, in yeah. fact, want to purchase a device that required you to go through elaborate you know, procedures to talk to a machine. <laughs> but here's the problem. Right. When you bring an Alexa into your home, you your children may start being rude to the Alexa, and they learn to be rude. And then when they go to the playground, they're rude to each other. So the introduction of this machine into our midst is changing how we treat each other. And that's that's what my laboratory is studying. And one of the things my laboratory is studying and one of the things we're hoping to invent forms of artificial intelligence, we have done. We've invented different forms of artificial intelligence that allow group performance to be optimized. Yeah, so so that's very interesting. So the design of AI has to go back and forth a little bit. So there's sort of a titration, fine tuning that needs to be done. It cannot be independent. Uh, I would I would certainly agree with that. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Yeah, thanks so much, Nicholas, for spending time with me. This is exciting. Thank research. you, Gil. Thank you so much for having me. All right, Thank bye you. bye. Bye. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.